Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our morning service. It's very nice to be with you once again. We're going to worship the Lord Jesus as we sing hymn number 106. All songs this morning are from Singing the Faith. 106, thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. of adoration and confession so shall we pray dear heavenly father we worship you this morning we thank you for the great privilege of being able to come into your holy presence and we don't come father because we think we are worthy 
we come because we trust in the merits of the Lord Jesus. We come because he shed his blood for us and he makes us worthy. And we come because Jesus is our saviour. And we come because we want to speak to you, dear Father, and worship you. And we want to tell you how much we love you this morning. You are indeed the great God of wonders. All the wonders of creation, all the things that we can see, the beautiful things that we can see, the intricate things that we can't see, and the things that are so far and distant, no one will ever see. But you have created them all for your glory. And we thank you, dear Father, that although you are this mighty God, ruler of the universe, you also are very close to each one of us. And we thank you, dear Father, for the assurance of our salvation through our faith in Jesus. And uh, we know, dear Father, that although we try to be good Christians and although we have your Holy Spirit indwelling us, we do fail. We fail so often. But you have told us, Father, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us. And we do that this morning, Father. We want to tell you the things that we have done wrong, the things where we have sinned. And uh, we ask you to forgive us in Jesus' precious name. Dear Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray that you change us by the power of your spirit working in our lives and make us sensitive to his leading. And make us good witnesses for Jesus and his resurrection. We pray for our service this morning, Father. And um, wherever people may be meeting, Lord, we pray for all your children, wherever they may be in the world. We pray for people here and we pray this morning and we pray for those listening online as well. And may the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, come and teach us this morning, change us, Lord. May we not be the same after this morning. May your Holy Spirit come and teach us and lead us and guide us. And Father, we gather up all these prayers and we ask them in the precious name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. We'll say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're now going to sing um, a hymn for Epiphany, which is 228, Hail to the Lord's Anointed.
going to read our Old Testament reading for us. The Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 to 5. I will speak out to encourage Jerusalem. I will not be silent until she is saved and her victory shines like a torch in the night. Jerusalem, the nations will see you victorious. All their kings will see your glory. You will be called by a new name, a name given by the Lord himself. You will be like a beautiful crown for the Lord. No longer will you be called forsaken or your land be called the deserted wife. Your new name will be God is pleased with her. Your land will be called happily married because the Lord is pleased with you and will be like a husband to your land. Like a young man taking a virgin as his bride, he who formed you will marry you. As a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God will delight in you. Thank you, Sue. And we're all going to sing now hymn number 353, Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. Sue is going to read our New Testament reading for us. The New Testament reading is taken from St John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine left. You must not tell me what to do, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Jesus' mother then told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. The Jews have rules about ritual washing, and for this purpose, six stone water jars were there each one large enough to hold a hundred litres. 
Jesus said to the servants, Fill these jars with water. They filled them to the brim, and he told them, Now draw some water out and take it to the man in charge of the feast. They took him the water, which had now turned into wine, and he tasted it. He didn't know where this wine had come from, but of course the servants who had drawn the water knew. So he called the bridegroom and he said to him, Everyone else serves the best wine first, and after the guests have had plenty to drink, he then serves the ordinary wine. But you have kept the best wine until now. Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana in Galilee, and there he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Sue, for doing our for reading our our uh, New and Old Testament readings this morning. We're still in the church season called Epiphany. And it means a manifestation or a revelation or a demonstration. In other words, making it clear to us who Jesus is. John's Gospel calls the miracles of Jesus signs. And he cherry picks certain incidents in order to demonstrate, to show us, to make it clear to us who Jesus is. The miracle at Cana, this wedding i must admit is is one of my favorites it's perhaps because it was jesus's first miracle and he did keep the party going but i think it's because he turned the he was the, the miracle of turning ordinary well water into perfectly fermented wine and it is a picture a pattern if you like of the many other miracles of Jesus which are found within the scriptures. Weddings are joyful occasions mostly. Wine in scripture indicates joy. Jesus turns up with his newly appointed disciples and many commentators say that there would only be about five disciples at this point. A rabbi's disciples would be would accompany him 24 7. They would live his life with him. It wasn't just that he taught them and they sat at his feet and then they went home. No, they, they lived with him 24 7. The responsibility for the wedding arrangements, especially the catering, would fall to the groom and his family. And you never really knew how many people were going to turn up at wedding celebrations and they could last several days as well. To run out of food or wine would be shameful for the young couple's families, would not be a good start to their new life together. And because Mary, Jesus's mother, takes on the responsibility of trying to sort something out, trying to come up with something, she was probably a close relative of the groom and his family. Firstly, I think this sign demonstrates, makes clear, um, makes clear to us that Jesus is Lord of the creation. Jesus used six clay pots, and that's significant as there were, as you remember, six days of creation. Here, Jesus shows his authority over the laws of nature. Just as Jesus had authority over the laws of nature at the beginning of creation. In fact, he created the laws of nature. According to John chapter 1, Jesus made all things. And here Jesus proves his power over the natural elements with a miracle which had profound meaning. Many people dispute the biblical story of creation because of the time factor. People forget that the God of this universe created the natural laws, but he himself is not bound by them. God did not have to take time to create anything. He spoke. His word is all powerful 
and all things came into existence. Now, to make wine, you need certain things. You need sun and rain, the right sort of soil, but also a key element is time. It takes time for wine to ferment, to age naturally and normally. But Jesus took ordinary well water and in an instant he produced perfectly aged wine. Jesus instructed the servants to fill the pots right to the brim so that nothing could be added. And altogether this would have produced about 1,200 pints. Some people have trouble believing in this kind of miracle, but it's only because they do not understand the kind of God that we worship. You see, turning water into wine is something that God does every day. Several years ago, uh, Jeff, my husband and I visited some relations in Upper New York State in uh, the United States. And they took us to a vineyard where we had a wine tasting session. And the guide explained, he showed us all around the vineyard and, and everywhere. And he explained that the rain falls on the ground and the, and the vine draws the water up into the branches. Water is transformed into the juice of the grape. And when that juice goes through the natural process of fermentation, it will become fine wine. We could literally that day look out of the window and see the fine rain. It was it was raining quite uh, quite that drizzly sort of rain. And we could see the rain fall and we could see part of the process of God changing water into wine. In Jewish tradition, when a new bottle of wine was opened, a blessing or maybe a, a skin of wine was open, uh, a blessing would be said over it. The master of the ceremony at this wedding would say, blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe. You created the fruit of the vine. And at this point, the disciples would have had a real aha moment. They would have had an epiphany. Who had just made the fruit of the vine? Jesus. But according to the blessing, only God could do that. We read that the disciples put their trust in Jesus, not because of a party trick, but because in a very Jewish way, Jesus has revealed who he is, creator of the vine and therefore king of the universe. At the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus proclaims who he is. In this miracle, Jesus shows his lordship, his authority over creation. And secondly, Jesus shows that he is Lord of transformation. Jesus used six water pots. Now, as I said, numbers are very important in the Bible. They represent things. And number six not only represents the days of creation, but also stands for the number of man, human beings. If you read in, that's really, really very obvious if you read Revelation chapter 13. And remember, God made human beings on the sixth day of creation. Adam was created from the dust of the ground, much in the same way as the clay pots had come into being. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The word formed is so the Hebrew scholars tell us, is used in scripture to describe a potter making pots. It's done with some care and attention. Although God, God spoke the worlds into existence in an instant, he took time to fashion human beings. And consider the water pots and imagine, imagine ourselves as being as being one of them. 
And that's not too fanciful because we read in Isaiah ch chapter 64, verse 8, but you are Father Lord, we are the clay and you are the potter. And there's New Testament references as well to us being earthen vessels, vessels and having treasure within. Now, it's important to realise that Jesus didn't change the pots. He didn't, he didn't change the pots on the outside or he changed what was inside the pots. The ordinary water changed instantly to the best wine. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. All things become new. We are made new on the inside when we repent and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for sin, our sin. As fast as the water became wine, all who have experienced salvation in Jesus have had a heart change. See how God is in the transformation business. We might think if we get a new hairdo, new wardrobe, better job, learn a new skill, lose weight, get a facelift. That's going to transform us. That's going to change us. But Jesus wants to change our hearts. He wants to make you a new person. He doesn't want to rearrange you. He wants to transform you. You may want to look better on the outside, but he wants to make you new on the inside. Jesus has the power to take the ordinary, the six clay pots, you and me, and make something extraordinary, something, someone, someone who is redeemed and saved and has the Holy Spirit indwelling them. The six clay jars were for Jewish purification rituals and they were hygiene. The Old Testament law was very concerned with cleanliness, but cleanliness was also bound up with ritual. And the ritual was part and parcel of making you right with God, bringing you into a relationship with God through ritual. And Jesus is making clear that ritual, Old Testament ritual, cannot make you clean. That was just a temporary arrangement. But it cannot make you clean or it cannot make you right with God. Only the transforming power of Christ can do that. And finally, Jesus demonstrates to us that he, he is Lord of eternity. It's significant that Jesus was at a wedding, a marriage, when he changed the water into wine. God really likes weddings. Marriage is God's idea. At the beginning of time, before there was any culture, God ordained marriage. So it's a creation ordinance. And because of that, because it's a creation ordinance, it's a target for the devil's attacks, just like the church and Israel. All those things were initiated, instituted by God. And so they are targets of the devil. God has a marriage arranged in heaven at some point in the future. Revelation 19 tells us, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the Lamb, that's Jesus, has come. And his wife, that's us, has made herself ready. The bride or the betrothed of Christ is the church, those who have put their faith in Jesus as saviour. And obviously Jesus is the bridegroom. And at some point in the future, we who have trusted in Jesus will be ushered into heaven just as a bride gets ready to meet her husband and there will be a great banquet. Because like the water in Cana that day was changed instantly into perfect wine, 
we will also be changed into a new and perfect body fit for heaven and eternity. We're now going to sing hymn number 351, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. going to um, say our prayers of intercession. There will be some time for you to make your own prayers before the Lord in your own hearts. Dear Father, we confess our own failings and lack of compassion and love. May we learn to forgive even as you have forgiven us, that we may live together in unity and we thank you for your patience and grace for all those who feel in spiritual crisis in their lives. And most of all, we thank you for being beside us at all times, whether we recognise this or not. Lord, we ask you that you bring light into the dark times. We ask that you look over the people that we know who are in need of your comforting presence at the moment. We especially pray for anyone who belongs to this fellowship and who are part of our family. And Father, we think of any who are questioning who Jesus is, who may be suffering in mind, body or spirit. We ask you to touch and bless them, Lord. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our communities in Britain at this time. Communities that are suffering poverty and deprivation, or maybe violence, unrest. And we pray, Father, for those who are still feeling the effects of the COVID pandemic, whether in bereavement or financial, or they are suffering with their health. 
and we pray for the Christian communities that you may embolden your servants. And may our churches be beacons of hope and compassion and strength and by their lives be examples of your Son, the Lord Jesus, drawing others to you. And Father, we pray for our leaders nationally and locally, as your word has commanded us to do. We pray that we may be led wisely and well. And we pray for our national government in this time of uncertainty for many people. And Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We pray for all who are suffering poverty and persecution, slavery, oppression, injustice and the effects of conflict. And Father, we lift to you especially this terrible situation in, in Afghanistan. We do pray, Lord, for um, compassion and wisdom and courage for world leaders to do something about this situation. And we know it's not easy, Lord. We know that. But we lift this situation to you anyway and ask you to help. Ask, ask for your help and power to change things. We lift before your gracious throne, dear Father, so many other places in the world. We ask your, we ask the same Lord for Yemen, which has gone out of the news a little bit now, but we, we pray for that situation also. We pray for your mercy and compassion there. And make us good stewards of the resources that you have given us in the creation and keep us ever mindful of our responsibilities towards your lovely creation. And finally, Father, we pray for the church and we pray for our brothers and sisters, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation. And we know, Father, that in many places in the world, it is so dangerous to be a Christian believer. And we remember that we are all subject to the Lord Jesus, who is the head. We ask your Holy Spirit's guidance on all our church leaders, Father. And we pray for the ministers and staff of this circuit. And at a time when many question the relevance of the church, give us strength to be good witnesses for the Lord Jesus in our own families and in our own communities. And I thank you, Father, that we are a welcoming body of Christ here at Balderton. And so when people think about this church, they think about the real church, the people of God who worship here. Jesus is here, ready to speak peace, ready to rejoice with his disciples, ready to empower us for his mission by providing us with the gracious Holy Spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, that as your disciples, your church would be willing, always willing to follow you, ready to witness to your resurrection power, ready to proclaim what you have done, what you are doing and what you will do in the future. And we gather up all these prayers and we ask them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is 470, Lord for the years your love has kept and guided.
blessing at the end of our service. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Of a broken heart Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring To so faithful a friend To so loving a king Savior, what can be said? What can be sung As a praise of your name For the things you have done Receive the sacrifice of a broken.